A little over 15 years ago, uh, I stood in a busy airport terminal uh, at the ticket counter, ready to come home after our honeymoon. Uh, we had spent seven days in Mexico for our honeymoon, and it was a great time. We had a lot of fun. Um, but now we we're prepared to leave, and there was one thing that was stopping us at this ticket counter. We had a bag that was over the weight limit. If you've flown any, you know that if your bag weighs more than 50 pounds, you have to pay an additional fee. Now, to save money, my wife and I shoved, I mean, placed all of our clothes into one suitcase. And, you know, not only that, over the span of a honeymoon, we had bought souvenirs and different things to bring home. Um, I also found that we had multiple curling irons. I only thought there was only one kind. That's the trip I found out. There's multiple, and they had different purposes and different things. And they're not even all curling irons. I'm using the wrong word, but to me, I don't know. I knew them as curling irons and blow dryers and other things. But here we were with our suitcase weighing too much, and we had a decision to make. Would we cling or hold on to these things that were weighing down the suitcase, or would we let them go so we could board our plane and come back to the United States? Now, that may seem like a pretty simple decision, but we still had to open up our suitcase there on the floor in front of the ticket counter with a bunch of people around and decide right then and right there what we let go of and what we couldn't let go of. What we were, because it wasn't just like, oh, we'll put this here, we'll come back and get it. No, we were in Mexico. <laughs> we moved some things to our carry-on bags, and we threw away some other things that were like, we're just going to have to get rid of this. Now, it's not too hard to do that in the context of a, of a, of a you know, when you're flying on an airplane, when you're dealing with, with luggage and that kind of stuff, and you're in the crunch of, hey, we got to get rid of this because we have a plane to board and that kind of stuff. But throughout our lives, we face times when we don't easily let go of things good or bad. It doesn't seem to matter whether they were good or bad. Sometimes we just have a hard time of letting go of stuff. We struggle often with just kind of letting things go. It could be a grudge against someone specific. Maybe someone's hurt us in the past and we just can't get over it. We can't let go of it. We, we want to, we tell ourselves, but there's just some people that like they have done stuff to us and no matter how hard we try, we just can't get over it. Or maybe there's a group of people, that, that, that group, they, they, they left me out, they said this to me, they said this about my country, they said this about just whatever it might be, I can't forgive them. Or maybe there's a company that did us wrong and they're saying, you know what, they messed me over, I can't forgive them. Sometimes, though, it's something great, like a past event. Or it's a time period where everything was just going right. And despite what it looks like right now, we look back at it with these kind of rose-colored glasses, you've heard that saying, we look, we look at things and just say, like, you know what, that's when life was great. We look back on that. A lot of times we look back and we say, I understand that world we used to live in. I knew how things worked. I knew things, what we should be doing. Sometimes, I, sometimes it's feelings we love. Sometimes it can be attitudes, things, and people. We all look back and say, man, I really love that thing. I can't let that go. Even when you and I know in our head it may be better to let something go, our hearts don't always make it easy or even possible. That little graphic there is not... It's kind of funny about how often our heart and our head don't always line up with the same decision. Today we're going to step into seven verses of Isaiah chapter 43. And what we find is God is speaking to the people of Israel about such a situation. Where just like the suitcase on my honeymoon, they needed to let go of some things before they could move forward on to what God had for them. And so if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Isaiah chapter 43. We'll begin in the 14th verse, and here's what we read. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the, Fo the Holy One of Israel. For your sakes I will send an army against Babylon, forcing the Babylonians to flee in those ships they are so proud of. This passage starts out by God telling the people of Israel, telling His people that their time in their current situation in Babylon will not last forever. Their current situation, if you know kind of the context of what's going on here, was one where they woke up every morning and they were disoriented by the landscape and the culture around them. It wasn't the culture of Israel. It wasn't the landscape of what their homeland looked like. The promised land looked a lot different than where they were today. And so to them, it was not where they naturally wanted to be. They had been taken by the Babylonians away from Jerusalem to live in Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar. Many of us are familiar with that story. 
But the world that they knew back home, the customs, the way of life, they had always known the social norms of their day, the way they greeted one another, the way you earned your living, even the people you married, the things you did for fun, the whole way of life that they had once known was all gone because now they were in Babylon. And so I have to believe they were in unknown territory. They looked around and nothing was familiar. Things didn't work in their world like they used to back in the Holy Land. Like they were supposed to in their mind. They're like, that's not how things are supposed to work. They're supposed to work where we are blessed because the temple is still standing. Can you relate to that at all? Can you relate to looking around and wondering what in the world is going on? Do you ever watch or read the news and wonder if not only half the world has gone crazy, but maybe God has kind of forgotten about it or fallen asleep at the wheel? I don't know. Some of you look pretty skeptical. I I know that happens to me sometimes. Because I can look around and be like, what in the world is going on? Like, this isn't how I remember it. Not only are the prices at the drive-thru more expensive, but (laughs) people act in ways that I just can't relate to. We just had a discussion this morning about things that are happening in schools, and it's like, Man, that that just seems like, compared to the school I went to, that seems completely different. That seems completely odd. And so we can relate to a little bit of being someplace where we don't really recognize what's going on. Or maybe those are two big things. You don't think about things on that big of a scale, but maybe you wake up every morning and your life is nowhere near where you intended it to be. Maybe you want your life to be somewhere different than it is now or where you think God wants it to be and you're saying, where, how did I ever get here? Whether adulting is just too overwhelming, raising a family has you in a tailspin, keeping it together isn't really happening for you, or even just the unknown of what's next, what's on the other side of today, has you feeling anxious, suffocated, or even trapped. I think regardless of the situation, if you find yourself not living in the fullness of what you thought your life would be, you are hearing the words of Isaiah in a similar context to his hearers over 2,000 years ago. So sometimes we say we can't relate to these people. I'm telling you, you can relate to these people. But right as we start the passage, there's something to pay attention here. God is saying, for your sake... He says, for your sake, I will make a way out of here. God is saying, I haven't forgotten you, even in this crazy world, and I am at work on your behalf, making a way forward for you. And what God said to them echoes true today. He has not forgotten about you, and he is at work for your sake. You might not be always be able to see it. You may not always be able to understand it. You may not be able to see it because there's so much going on around you. But never forget that God sees you, knows you, and is at work on your behalf to make a way out if you will follow him. Now, his way out might look different than your way. But that does not mean that he is not at work on your behalf. He continues in verse 15. It says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's Creator, And king, I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots and horses. I drew them beneath the waves, and they drowned, their lives snuffed out like a smoldering candle wick. I hear God saying in this passage, Hey, I am the God who created you. I am the God who rescued you from Egypt, parting the sea to give you dry land to walk on. Don't forget who I am. Don't forget who you're dealing with. Don't forget who has his eye on you, who's watching you, who's, who's with you through this. And they would have known that story, even though they weren't the same people that, that went through there. They would have known that story because the people of Israel, even in unfamiliar territory, told and retold the stories of the past miracles of God. They had testimony time. That's what we call it today, right? They had testimony time on the regular. So all of them knew all about what God had done before. God is saying, I'm at work for you. Remember, I'm the God that you talk about so much already. But then he takes a turn. 
He takes a turn. He said, all these things I've done for you. Don't forget who I am. Don't forget who you're dealing with. But then in verse 18, he takes a little bit of a turn. He says, but forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do, for I am about to do something new. The NIV translation says, do not dwell on the past. Bless you. The GNT says, do not cling to the events of the past. God says, I'm about to do a new thing, or I am making a way out differently than what you were used to. Because what were they used to? They were used to waves being parted and walking on dry ground. He said, I'm the same God, but I like to mix things up. I'm the same God that did that, so so have faith in me, but but don't think it's going to happen exactly the same way. I talk about all the time. I love to talk about how many times did God pulled on the walls of a city by having Israelites march around it. What? Once. Well, yeah, seven times on that. I got caught on that. I got to ask that question differently because that's twice now I got caught on the seven. Yes, seven times on the seventh day. But he never did that for another city. Right? One way. One time. Now, if it's us, what would we do? We'd say, man, we got to package this up. There'd be a sermon series coming out, how to march around the walls of, of, how to get victory through marching around the walls. We'd sell it to other cities. Hey, you know what? If you want to conquer this city, let me tell you God's secret way. I have this, uh, this way that I got from, from the Holy Land. I have it bottled up and packaged for you for like 1999. I'll tell you the way to defeat your problems. And we'd say, walk around it seven times. But God did it one time that way, one city. These verses are key because what God is saying is before you can move on, you have to let this stuff from the past go. He's saying before you can move on to what I want to do in the new way, you can't keep looking for it in the old way. I believe what he's saying to them is, although I am the same God who parted the Red Sea to make a way out of Egypt, this is completely a different time, and I'm making a new way to save you. Forget what you know. Don't look for the same thing. He's saying don't Put me in a box based on Egypt. Because if you only look for God in the ways he did it before, you're not going to see what he's doing now. And it doesn't mean he never does things the same way, but more often than not, it's different. But it's the same God. The method changes, the God does not. Sure, the previous way was great. I mean, he's not saying forget that it was nonsense, but he's saying that was nothing. If you saw that, I was just kind of like dipping my toe in a little bit. I'm going to do something even bigger than that. But that way was great, because that's what people hear sometimes when they say, let's move on. They're saying, well, but that was great. It was so awesome. Yes, it was. It was a way to salvation and a way to freedom, but God is doing a new thing, and you'll miss it if you just keep looking for the parting of the sea. Here's all I talk about a little bit. Now, this isn't the exact suitcase I used on my honeymoon, but... This is a suitcase I, I've used. This is a stormtrooper from Star Wars, if you don't know. And uh, Star Wars is just, by a matter of fact, the best movie ever made. So that's why um, I have this. Uh, but, <laughs> and, and you can tell it's been through a lot of different um, trips with me. It holds up. Um, the interesting that I was telling Dora this morning when I came in, I said, the good thing about this suitcase is I never mistake it for anybody else's when it's on the like, turnstile at the airport. Right? Easy to identify. But can you imagine if you're on this, you had this suitcase, and you were trying to get onto like a subway or a train, and the door's closed and the bag's on the outside, and the the, the tram or the subway is trying to take us someplace new, but we have, if I can get this, my prop's not cooperating, but we have a hold of our baggage that's on the outside of the train. And we're saying, I want to go someplace new. Let me bring along what I know. And I feel like in some ways, God's saying, that's not going to work that way. You can't get on the subway. You can't get on the train unless you let go of the baggage of the past. It's holding you back. It's holding you outside of where things are going. And I think God is saying the same thing here. He's saying, don't let the past methods put you in a box of where that can be the only way that God works. And sometimes we get that way, don't we? We get attached to things more than the things that point to God. We want to stake a claim and say, over my dead body, are we getting rid of whatever? 
God continues. See, I have already begun. Don't, do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. The wild animals in the fields will thank me. The jackals and owls too for giving them water in the desert. Yes, I will make rivers in the dry wasteland so my chosen people can be refreshed. I have made Israel for myself and they will someday honor me before the whole world. He's talking about not just making a path through the Red Sea to safety. He's saying he's going to make a whole new path in the wilderness. And he's bringing rivers or waters to people to refresh them. So what you have is two distinct realities that swing on the hinge of verses 18 and 19. You have a God who created them, a God who loves them, a God who has rescued them in the past, and now you have that same God making a new path, and He is at work to bring them a new blessing. And as they move from the former to the latter, He's saying, I know this is going to be scary because it's not been anything you've been in, but you can trust Me. And so you can trust Him. It might be a different look. It might be a different feel, but it's the same God, so you can trust that same God. That's the point of testimonies, right? When we used to have testimony time and say, let me tell you about the goodness of God, it was to say, hey, God has done this in my life, and I give you a testimony to praise God and let you know you can have that too. And so the word testimony actually means a request for God to do it again. And so this testimony is to say, it's the same God. I can give a testimony that looks and sounds nothing, exact, nothing like yours, but it's the same God. And so not only can we and the Israelites and the people of that time trust that the same God that got them out of Egypt will get them now out of Babylon. In fact, God says you have to. Because that is what it hinges on. Are the instructions or the guidance of verses 18 and 19. He's saying don't hold on, don't cling to the past. That's what he says. He said, don't hang on to it. To move from the memories of what was to the new movement and the reality of what God is doing now, the only way to pass from a memory to a reality is letting go of the old. Not because it wasn't good, but because God's doing something new. Not to cling to them as the memory of what God had done in a different context and culture was going to save them, but instead celebrate them as a reason to trust God. So we don't have to cling to what God has done in the past. Instead, we can trust God for what he's going to do in the future. I feel like that's what the whole passage is about. And it's about Jesus, and it's a prophecy, and we can get into that in another sermon. That's not the point of this sermon, but... It's exciting. But what does this all mean for us today? Right here, Rock Island First Church of the Nazarene. What does this mean for each of us, as, not only as individuals, which is a good question to ask, but what does that mean for us corporately? What I believe we see in this passage is that like the Israelites who long for a new way forward, if we really long for a new way of life, not just For five days or 50 days or even five minutes, we're going to have to let go of the old because it's holding us back. Keeping us from new things that God wants to do both in us and through us and around us. Just like a physical suitcase can get caught up while while we're kind of lugging it around, the baggage we lug around can do the same thing to us. That's why for some of us sitting here today, you have only experienced some of the blessings that God has for you, I believe. Because it's like your bag is caught in the door closing behind you. But you just can't let go to move into the future reality that God has for you. We feel safe. We know what it is. Maybe it's something that our mom raised us on. Maybe it's something our dad raised it on. Maybe it's some old soul that was just a saint that helped us move into something else. We're saying, I can't let go because I'd be being disloyal to them. But God's saying, I want to do something new to you. And so we're stuck. And we only have some of the blessing of a life with God. And so what happens is you get a small taste of the blessing, but you have not experienced all that God has for you because you aren't all in on the now. Or maybe 
for some of us here today, the past was so great for us with God that we can't imagine a future where those same past things aren't an integral part to what he wants to do now. I call this kind of the emotional, nostalgic view of God, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with it, but the best way to talk about it, I think, is, is Christmas, right? Like, most of us grew up around Christmas with certain traditions, right? And so we'd say, man, it's not Christmas until we hear the Christmas story. It's not Christmas until the stockings are hung up and we have a tree that's decorated. It's not Christmas until we eat a ham or a turkey. You know, there's certain things in our life, and, and sometimes you find these out when you maybe get married or try to live with someone else, and they're saying, well, Christmas in my house always looked this way. And someone said, well, Christmas in my house looked nothing like that. It looked a completely different way. But you kind of put those together. But that's the best way to think about it, because there's some of us that, like, we want to do new things, but we're also thinking, like, oh, man, I, I got to do this. It's Christmas. We have to do that, right? It's an emotional, nostalgic, like, attachment to something in the past. There's nothing wrong with it. But that's what it's like for some people to say, hey, we're going to do things different. They're saying, whoa, 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 whoa. It's not church. Or it's not me dealing with God unless we have this, this, and this. It's not, really, I can't engage the Spirit unless this happens and this happens and this happens. And the hard part is, is those things aren't necessarily bad, but they might be keeping us from accomplishing the mission that God has for us. There's a person that I talk to, and, and I love them deeply, and they love me better and more, probably. And I'm related to them, but I'm not going to bust them out who they are on the camera. Um, anyway, and they were telling me, they, they go to a church, and, the, and that church has um, a contemporary service, and then they have a new worship service, and they don't really sing any hymns. And this person's in their 70s, and they said, I love hymns. And they said, you know, I try to sing the new songs, and I just don't feel the same way I did when we sing the new wave. And I said, I understand that. Because when we sing a certain hymn, or we sing a certain song that you grew up with, it takes you back to a poignant moment in your life. And you can, rem you can remember what it smelled like, what it looked like, and the experience you had. But at the same time, we don't worship our feelings. We worship God. And so if the mission of the church is to, uh, to bring other people into a relationship with God, as we are the only organization that exists for people that aren't here yet, then we don't worship the feelings, then we worship God that says, I'm doing a new thing. Now, I'm not saying you get rid of hymns or to keep hymns. That's not the point of what I'm saying. The point is, though, is we don't worship how we felt or used to feel or how we feel when those things are done. We worship a God that sometimes uses feelings, but sometimes uses other things to draw others into relationship with him. But it can be hard, can it? Can we just admit that? It's hard sometimes because our heart wants to, wants to hold on to what we know. And this isn't a bad baggage. This is the stuff I love. This is the stuff that has helped me over the years. And so sometimes when God comes along and tries to do something new, we're saying, I'd love to, I just can't. So there's some people that are, have that. Not bad things, it's just different. And so we have trouble letting those go. And for even more of us here today, I think if we were to do an inventory of the past baggage that we're trying to bring with us into the new reality that God has created us for, we realize it's emotional or mental baggage that we're trying to bring with us. It's the ways that people have hurt us. It's the ways that life has kind of knocked us down. It's the times that we've let our guard down in the past to show love to someone, and they've taken advantage of that and harmed us. It's the unfairness of it all when we look at the way, when we look around. It's kind of the overwhelming, soul-crushing feeling that we can't do anything right or that we can't catch a break, and no matter how hard we try, nothing seems to go our way. It's our insecurities and how we look and maybe what people think, if they think we're smart enough, if they think how much we make it or how much we don't make, or it's a myriad of different things that we bring onto ourselves that we let define us in one way or another. Some of us are bringing that with us. And no matter what we do, even making resolutions every January 1st to try harder and to be better, we just can't seem to forget, forgive, and let them go. 
It's tough. Isn't it? I mean, can we admit that sometimes that's us? But I want to tell you something. God wants you to experience the fullness of the blessing of what he is doing now. And not only does he want you to experience it, he is providing a way. Do you have to let go of the baggage of the past? Yes. Do you have to do it in your own strength and in your own willpower? No. God has given us the Holy Spirit that can do it in us and through us and and what we could not do on our own. He will take us through that. He will walk walk with us through that. Not because we're so great, but because He is. The Holy Spirit can transform us and empower us, but we have to trust Him that the same God that brought all these beautiful things Or the same God that was there even in the midst of all these terrible things that have kind of grinded us down and worn us down over life. That he can do something new. And he can bring good where it seems like there is none. And that when we sing about the goodness of God, it doesn't mean that everything's perfect. But it means that he is good still. We have to place more faith in what we will have in God than what we have now in our baggage. It's not easy, but it's possible. And it's the new way, the way of Jesus. Look at what Paul wrote in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Jesus didn't cling to his right to be God. He didn't cling and say, nope, I'm God, let them figure it out. He didn't cling to his right to stay put. Instead, he let go to embrace the new thing and came to earth to make a way to God. So let me ask you this morning, what are the baggage that you're holding on to? What thing from the past is holding you back from all that God has for you in 2023 and beyond? Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's someone you haven't been able to forgive. Maybe it's something that you just need to stop doing. Maybe it's an attitude that you know needs change. Maybe it's a hurt that you're kind of carrying around. Or maybe you're just sick and tired of living a life that is not fully uh, full of godly blessing and purpose. Whatever it is, I want to invite you to let go of that baggage, to fully embrace God. To not give him that one-armed hug that says, God, come come and get me, but turns away and says, God, I'm here. Can you do anything with me? Can you help me? Because his answer is yes. I have created you for life abundantly. And that is possible and available. Give God permission to do a new thing in you and through you. And I believe he will. We have the opportunity to engage in that invitation through the sacrament of communion. Hopefully you got a, one of these communion cups when you walked in. Sometimes people say, man, we take, we take communion too often. It turns into a ritual. It only turns into a ritual if you allow it. Because although we don't believe this is literally the, the body and the blood of Jesus, we do invite the Holy Spirit and His presence here with us to bless this moment now. Even though Jesus isn't physically present with us, He is through His Holy Spirit. And we can engage Him. This is what we consider to be a means of grace. Is that God can do something powerful in us through a moment like this as He draws our minds and our attention to Him. Some have been taught to only look at this as as a remembrance to do in a somber way, and and that's fine. But I I think the whole picture of it is, yes, it's somber for what Jesus sacrificed, but it's also a celebration of what we receive because of his sacrifice. And so it's kind of like a little bit of a party. 
and he brought the meal. It's to celebrate that it doesn't matter what you've done before now. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter the path that you've been walking on. Now is an opportunity to take that step into him. It doesn't matter what side of tracks you're from. It doesn't matter the story of your family up to this point. It doesn't matter what legacy has come before you. That can all be changed as you encounter the risen King, Jesus Christ. So he invites you to his table. He invites you to partake of what he offers. But you have to let go of what you already have been taking of. The invitation is always to turn away from going your own way to go the way of Jesus. And that's never more apparent or appropriate with communion. Sometimes we want it to be big and fancy, but that wasn't Jesus' style. He meets you where you are and says, come and partake of me. Come to me and I will give you rest. Come to me and I will make you new. And so we do remember when we take of these elements that on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. When they had finished eating, Jesus took the cup And he said, this represents my blood that is spilled for you for the new covenant. It's by his blood we are forgiven. It's by his blood we are healed. It's by his blood that we are brought into relationship with the Father. He says, as often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. Will you stand with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you.